Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, Brian here, coming to you uh, with a live video with Roman Hennis of uh, Peru's Batiti Institute. And uh, he should be joining us here shortly. How's everyone doing out there? So we're going to be talking about uh, the Petiti Institute um, and uh, kind of what they're all about. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Roman. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how he ended up down in Peru um, and then uh, how he ended up starting the Institute and uh, his nonprofit. Um, which is all about sustainability and preserving the environment and raising global consciousness and development. So, um, should be a really interesting interview. I'm feeling a little nervous. <laughs> Let's see, I got Gail out there. We'll say hi. And I'm not sure who that is. I have such a hard time reading my kids' names from Myanmar. Um... I have had nicknames for them all. Sweezy and Hin is watching. It's good to see you. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, but yeah, so Petiti. Um, I was just reading about it. Um, I've been reading about it a little bit um, for the last couple of weeks since I've been talking to to Roman um, about his institute. Oh, here he is. Uh, let's see if we can add Roman... Bring Roman Hennis on camera, yes. And he's adding right now. Hi, there he is. Hey, Brian. How's it going, Roman? It's going well, how are you? I'm good. Um, it looks like my camera's a little bit dark. Let's try moving here. There we go. Um, uh -huh. What's going on with you today? I was just doing a little introduction. Um, I was uh -huh. about to read um, uh, the definition in Quechua of Petiti, which I was just reading about. Mm -hmm. I, I was really touched by that. Um, so the definition of Petiti in Quechua is an enlightened realm manifested through the awakening of our shared human heart. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and I think that's a good place to start. Mm. Yeah, the local people refer to it as the heart of all the hearts. The heart of all the hearts. Can you say more about that? Well, apart from what you just shared, um, Paititi has been uh, recognized as this um, enlightened realm. Some people interpret it in a more literal way as this... Uh, kind of uh, El Dorado, which is a city that is hidden in the rainforest, just uh, behind the mountain that uh, our center is located. But uh, the elders refer to it really as this uh, portal into the realm of enlightened ancestors, a realm where there is uh, great love abiding and people can uh, connect and relate to each other in a very profound way, in a way that uh, eliminates all the diseases and sicknesses and conflicts. And this is something that uh, the legend tells uh, is uh, essential for our life as human beings and something for us to remember and bring back into the world. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm really getting about your institute, I mean, in, in this day and age, um, well, I mean, we haven't really gotten into um, like what you define your institute as other than, why don't you give us a brief description of, of how you would describe it? Because you have a nonprofit you've started as well, right? As you were just sharing because you're about more than just uh, providing wellness and healing and support for for people, um, just individuals. It's kind of what the, what I'm taking away is it's kind of looking at the whole earth as one living organism. And so, mm -hmm. um, and like the people included, you know, and we're all 
kind of one living, breathing organism. And correct me if I'm wrong. And just reading over some of um, your stuff on the website, um, and just your kind of your three um, tiered kind of approach of consciousness, stewardship, and healing. Um, but yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about about that? Mm. Well, I initially um, came to this uh, indigenous cultures uh, in uh, 2001. And uh, the main motivation I had at that time was an illness that I was dealing with, which was considered to be uh, genetic and incurable in Western medicine, in many cases, terminal. And um, this illness. Then, you said you had was that you had an yeah. illness that was. Mm -hmm terminal wow okay. right and um, the main intention that i had was to really uh, resolve this illness and understand the causes of it so that it can be resolved uh, to, to its root and then uh, as i began uh, working with these uh, traditions and essentially these traditions were a continuation of uh, a path of realization that I was already on, working with uh, the transpersonal psychology, recognizing the causes of the psychosomatic cause of this condition. And then uh, also working with uh, the indigenous wisdoms from other parts of the world that uh, includes the Northern Native American tradition that I was just starting to get a glimpse of. And then uh, also the uh, Tibetan lineages that uh, also brought me on this path of uh, consciousness and the recognition of uh, the spiritual path as uh, the consciousness of science. So can I, um, and uh, that so far you said, so you had a, a terminal disease you were saying like pretty much or, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And then that led you yeah, to pursuing spiritual works, inner work, healing, and and that's kind of mm -hmm. what brought you down to Peru, or yeah, that that was the catalyst in my own life. And uh, then um, coming to the indigenous traditions here, of course, that was a continuation of that. And um, then starting to work with these traditions and recognizing this um, mm, certain uh, living wisdom that uh, the uh, elders, the lineage holders in these traditions uh, were cultivating and uh, then starting to see that uh, this uh, living wisdom is something that has been cultivated through many generations, through thousands of years, and it is the result of uh, many, many individuals that put their collective focus and intention into this uh, recognition of something that we all share, something that is universal. Those uh, qualities that allow us to become uh, more complete human beings in a human body. This uh, em embodiment of uh, heart-centered presence. Of what presence? And uh, heart-centered heart presence. Presence, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's that then. And, uh, the heart-centered presence, or what did you say again? The catch one say that's the only heart, or the 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 true heart, or the heart of all the hearts. The heart of all hearts. So it's kind mm -hmm. of the same, the same kind of heart you're talking about. A heart centered. And so the cultivation of this um, tradition, cultivation of this path, initially allowed me to resolve the uh, illness that I had and come to a full remission of it. It took me about eight months after I came down here to Peru. And uh, then throughout the years, uh, that was, of course, the physical resolution of the illness was uh, just the tip of the iceberg of a deeper process, which uh, continues to this day and for which I'm very grateful. And so then uh, the continuous cultivation of that, um, after about um, nine years or so, then resulted in the creation of the Paititi Institute, which I co-founded with um, my beloved wife. And um, when we co-founded the Paititi Institute, uh, my wife, she's been dedicating uh, um, 
at least as many years as I was to the indigenous healing traditions, she was dedicated to the permaculture mm. um, practices and uh, Did the you, you guys means of permaculture. You guys met. What is that? You two met in Peru, or we actually met in the U.S. first, and then uh, for about a year we we were good friends and started to collaborate and see different possibilities, and uh, then that resulted in us co-founding the institute, which was based on this marriage of the indigenous wisdom and permaculture, so that uh, this uh, original primordial state of being that the ancestors were so dedicated to can actually be um, brought into the world today and uh, continue to be cultivated in a more practical way. Mm. Yeah, I'm just really appreciating like this, you know, you and your, um, your wife, like creating this together and tell me her name again. I'm sorry. Cynthia. Cynthia. Um, and so this is kind of a, like a synthesis of, of like both of your kind of hearts. Um, how did you, and, and how did this kind of, is this, I imagine it's kind of evolved over the years, like your, um, your kind of, um, I, I, I guess you're calling this the Petiti's true nature. I mean, was it, almost when I read it, it was kind of like, it almost seemed like like something that just was like almost like a download or like some kind of um, like it really just jumped off the page to me. Um, yeah, through through the awakened spirit of the individual comes the greatest potential for transformation of the planet. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then talking about your kind of five part. Um, Cat five categories that you really focus on conserving and restoring the earth's natural resources, preserving and integrating indigenous wisdom and culture, uh, cultivating health through traditional and natural methods, um, embodying true stewardship via eco regenerative community living and understanding consciousness and engaging in cognitive evolution. I'd love to um, unpack like each of those. <laughs> But like, I, I get a sense that there's like, um, yeah, you both shared in those, you know, like you, you mentioned the permaculture and then, and then the spirituality and this kind of uh, ancient wisdom combined with um, preservation and um, yeah, permaculture. It's lovely. Um, mm -hmm. So conserving and restoring the earth's natural, actually what, what really, stood out um embodying true stewardship v via eco regenerative community living so that was one thing that really I w i'm interested in is so is it's an intentional community and there's people that live there year round um mm -hmm. is that true or... yeah to, throughout the year we have the steady group of people that are living in our center and are caretaking Mm -hmm. the place and then uh, at different times we have uh, different initiatives different programs retreats and workshops where people come and then uh, live in a community for different periods of time maybe two weeks or one month or seven weeks so that uh, we have temporary communities that are created during those times and then with the help of the indigenous wisdom and different modern social technologies, we can see very powerful examples of a sense of community that can be created in a relatively short period of time. And then we have the core team that is there throughout the whole time and then we can cultivate deeper and deeper facets of uh, this uh, relatedness and authentic connection that uh, we can then share with the more temporary communities that come over. I have a question here on this uh, particular topic. Um, so a friend of mine, Gail, she's actually a yoga teacher in Telluride, Colorado. Hey, Gail. Mm -hmm. uh, she mm -hmm. says, many people can the community host and what does it cost to come and stay? 
Well, throughout the year, like I said, we have the steady uh, group of people that are at the land, which is our main community, and uh, it's eight people right now. And then uh, we have different initiatives and programs. Now, the staying in the community, we have different ways that people can come and uh, uh, develop a relationship with us. And this is something that... Uh, we've been really um, cultivating and uh, applying in our communities this uh, recognition how essential it is to develop a relationship, to develop a connection. There are many communities uh, that are formed all over the world and um, many of them last for only so long. And so then uh, seeing what is it really that makes the community last and then recognizing that actually uh, this uh, relatedness and connection and not just uh, seeing that we have maybe the common purpose or goal and then coming together but learning how to take the time and relate to each other as human beings and so for us this uh, quality is much more essential than quantity and then uh, initially Different people, uh, we have work-study service programs that uh, people come to and uh, then start to see really what we are about. Because, of course, I can talk about it, but um, it's really through this uh, shared presence that it becomes more tangible. And it sounds, uh, so, sounds like there's more, like many different options. So there's people, core staff. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, get, there, are, there are many different options. Yeah. And so then, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. You know, and this is something yeah, that I see that, uh, yeah, if there is really a connection, then people find a way for us to relate and connect. And so um, here's, as far as my, it's how we can usually there's how we can be all uh, complementing each other. Right. In service to that shared purpose, the you, greater vision. Shared purpose of the greater vision, you said? Yeah, mm -hmm. cultivating that. Um, you mentioned the work study. I know there's, um, I've heard of, you know, similar things. So what, is, what does that entail? Like somebody comes and spends a certain amount of time and kind of helps out on staff and then uh, have, what, receive some sort of discount or? Well, the work study service program is uh, a program that uh, is, uh, either based on uh, the path of the transformation and people come and support the transformation retreats that we have, the embodying true nature retreats. And then the other uh, route is uh, doing the permaculture uh, events mm -hmm. and uh, the permaculture uh, certification programs that we have while we are working with uh, our teachers that uh, come from different parts of the world. And um, essentially the work-study service is a program where people come and then partake in the main facets of the programs while at the same time supporting the many different uh, logistics and uh, the facets of the program that um, need some uh, people that are involved in actually holding the container mm. and chopping wood or working in the kitchen. And um, this is also a program that we developed based on recognition, how we can really develop uh, and work on the reciprocity. So, what, so when, with, the, uh, so when the community. So when normal people come, um, or normal, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me the way I speak sometimes. Um, so when people come, you know, specifically maybe just to do a retreat or an education to be like, I've done similar things. Um, and I know you mentioned like kind of rubbing elbows with people that are working in the garden or people that are there on staff. Do, do people that come there and participate, say, in a plant medicine retreat for a few weeks or something is like doing work around the community part of, of, of that experience? Like, is, does everyone kind of participate um, in some way? Everyone is participating in different ways, right? So then uh, the people who come into the work-study service program, they participate, of course, 
in uh, the gardening work and uh, in the work that uh, requires um, all kinds of uh, different um, physical aspects of the retreat support and at the same time are also participating in the main facets of the retreat, so the main talks or practices and uh, some of the ceremonies. And the people who come as participants also have an option of engaging in some of the gardening work as part of the meditation and uh, engaging in the different uh, activities at different parts of the retreat. But the retreats themselves, if we are talking about the transformation retreats, let's say, they are uh, very, um, how to say, there is a very uh, intense curriculum uh, in this retreat. Is it like a rigorous? So yeah. It is a very rigorous curriculum, and even that is... Um, <laughs> just an introduction into this work. The indigenous traditions, uh, many people think that the indigenous traditions don't involve much discipline, but uh, actually I've never seen more discipline being a part of people's lives than in the indigenous traditions. And of course that's part of them living in very harsh circumstances with lots of challenges and then really needing to work together and coordinate among themselves and then um, coordinate and relate to each other on many levels from the everyday mundane level to very deep soul connections. Mm -hmm. And this is what allowed people to overcome many different uh, challenges and difficulties in the circumstances that they lived in. Yeah, I, and you work with all kinds of different, um, you know, people with all kinds of different situations, uh, illnesses, challenges going on. Can you speak to some of that? Or Sure. Uh, we work with uh, people who come to face themselves. And uh, some people have different uh, particular physical illnesses and uh, health conditions. Some people have different uh, traumas and um, um, challenges in their lives that they don't know how to deal with and uh, face. And so, um, yeah, people with a variety of different health conditions, some of them more severe than others, people with many different uh, traumas and uh, histories of addiction, substance abuse, uh, violence in their lives, uh, people who have uh, been through very um, problematic experiences. And then also people who are actually um, dedicated to the path of uh, evolution of consciousness. And so people from all walks of life come to us from all ages. Um. Yeah, sorry, I was just like, um, kind of got lost in your words there for a minute. Um, I think that's a nice segue to actually to talk about um, kind of the subject of the, of the conversation, which is uh, building intercultural bridges, you know, because I'd imagine that you mentioned drug addiction, you mentioned, um, you know, several different um, modality or, you know, issues. Um, and and that's what the, the kind of subject of this talk is about, like how you've taken this ancient um, wisdom and re uh, refined it in a way um, that makes it more practically applicable to like the modern world. Um, and I'd imagine some of that is also, you know, say maybe for people with substance abuse issues or maybe for people with, you know, other, you name it. Um, so that's something I'm really wanting to hear more about. And then, um, yeah, why don't you just speak on that a little bit, like the cultural bridge um, and how you kind of, you explained that to me a little bit the other day. Um, you know, again, I imagine it's been kind of an evolution and it continues to be um, and will always be, but um, yeah, if you can speak a little bit like about what that means to you, creating cultural, intercultural bridges. Sure. Intercultural bridges essentially has to do with uh, this uh, universal human potential that the ancestors have 
been cultivating and then uh, bringing from generation to generation as a reminder for their uh, future generations of what is possible. And again, this is something that we all are familiar with to a certain degree. So we all know what it means to experience kindness or love or patience or uh, vulnerability. And uh, yet we are familiar with it to the degree that our own personal experience is allowing us to be familiar with that. While these traditions then are able to transmit on the energetic level an example of what those same states are in their fully uh, unraveled potential. And so then, of course, uh, just that is not enough because it has to be then brought to one's own personal experience. So, so then... Uh, yeah. Ancient wisdom you were talking about that's been there mm -hmm. and evolved over thousands of years. And now we're getting mm -hmm. this point. How do we take that and give it to, you know, the Western cult, Westernized culture, modern day culture. Anyway, I'm sorry. Well, this is not something new. This is something that has been a part of these traditions within each generation, then new people, new generation with their own particular challenges had to really learn how to bring those universal states of being into their particular circumstances. So and this is the only way how these wisdom traditions are able to survive until today is by each individual actually embodying that essence in their own life in whatever way is relevant. But you're, you're saying that, that that effort to create that bridge has always been there? Like, like uh, mm -hmm. in that in the culture, they've always tried to kind of reach out to other cultures or like when maybe other, can you explain that a little bit? Is that, cause that, I don't know, it really pains they reached me. Out to, uh -huh. They reached out to the new generations. Oh. So each new generation had to deal with their particular challenges. In our new generation, we have to deal with the challenge of globalization. This has not been a part of previous generations. And yet previous generations have all had certain challenges that they were particularly involved in. Uh, okay. And so then within each generation, this had to be brought on an individual personal level of experience. So you're saying this global effort is kind of, that's the new um, challenge or the new, um, you know, for, for that, for the ancient wisdom, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, I see. Um, how, I know many of the people that are tuning in here are, um, I, I, we've talked a little bit about the documentary that I'm creating um magic mm -hmm. revolution and initially for me it was um almost like it was is really um focused on authentic relating uh or circling some people call it or relational leadership um and now my you know it's 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 broadened a lot more to encompass a lot of other things including communities like yours um you know kind of more the, the the documentary I'm working on is 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 now more focused on just this collective global cultural evolution and transformation that's going on. And so I'm kind of looking at lots of different communities and leaders and practices and cultures um, and just really want to give the audience a lot of different flavors of what's out there um, just to actually see that it's actually happening. Um, for one thing, I think um, that would be really beneficial because uh, I think we're all kind of bombarded. Um, I personally don't watch much of any TV, but I think even not watching that you can't help in the States being bombarded with a lot of stuff. So um, I think it's important, like in this evolution, to kind of start shifting the narrative, you know, of what we're like really focusing on, you know, and focusing more on what we want versus what we don't want. You know, and I'm really interested in creating like more of an information stream, a media channel, you know, focused on those kinds of things. 
Um, but back to authentic relating, because I know many of the people that are following this documentary, um, and it is still a big part of it. And something I'm really curious about with your center because, or with, with Petiti Institute, uh, and how that plays into the uh, building of intercultural bridges. Um, could you talk about that a little bit and how I think you develop kind of your own brand of authentic relating and then one of our, um, I would say, leaders in our community, Brian Baer, uh, came down there on a retreat and shared some of his technology about uh, what, what, what he had actually written a book called The Art of Circling, which I'd, I'd read, I have actually up on my bookshelf here. And um, so, yeah, you can just talk a little bit about that. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Like how that plays. Well, um, we, do, we do our part and like you shared, everyone, who are uh, more awake in these times are starting to do their part in that way. And this is just part of the human nature of uh, recognizing that there is more to this life than what uh, the current um, mainstream society is able to offer. And um, within our experience, uh, we do recognize how this um, original state of being. Um, this is, again, uh, this uh, unconditional openness and relatedness is something that uh, goes beyond culture, tradition, religion. And um, this is something that we all share. Nobody has a copyright on that. And yet, uh, in different cultures, different traditions, uh, there is this um, particular angle that uh, is recognizing this essence in a way that makes it uh, more uh, objective. And so within, uh, within our own practices, we work with uh, several uh, indigenous traditions. We work with the uh, uh, traditions of the Amazonian rainforest. Uh, we work with the uh, uh, wisdom coming from the tribes of the Witoto, of the Ashuar, the Yagua, the Shipibo, and um, at the same time, we are also working with the uh, Indian uh, traditions that relate to Quechua and the Kero nations. Uh, also, some of the tribes that live in high mountain rainforests, such as the Machigengas and Wachiparis. And uh, then, of course, uh, recognizing the same natural state of being that uh, these indigenous traditions cultivate within their own cultural context. We are also seeing in the Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition that uh, we've also been working with and cultivating and then recognizing that actually the state of being, this uh, natural presence is uh, the same in both traditions and it is something that is um, um, not found in everyday society. This uh, state of being is so um, grounded in uh, unconditional presence within all circumstances and situations and not giving up when things get challenging and not running away and not distracting, which is something that is prevalent in today's world. So there is something very special that this uh, ancient cultures are able to share with us today, something that we can recognize and then of course while in these cultures this is something that is present within their particular context within their way of life at the same time uh, it is up to each one of us to learn how to bring it into everyday existence and so this is where the our work with the uh, transpersonal Jungian psychology has been very helpful just uh, translating the context the language and the symbols that the indigenous people are utilizing and then seeing how it actually is pointing mm. not just to those particular forms, to those particular customs and these traditions, but how it is very relevant to everything we're doing in our lives. That as Um, 
depression and sadness and uh, uh, actually the, the meaning of it is the same we are all dealing with uh, certain energetic intensities that uh, we can learn how to recognize and then apply those unconditional human qualities to in a way that we are no longer intimidated or bound by them and so in that way this uh, um, intercultural bridges they allow us to recognize how to bring that original um, universal human state of freedom into our current challenges and situations so the Jungian transpersonal psychology is very helpful with that and then um, of course of, uh, that's that's a lot about for those who don't really know about young Carl Jung and his particular brand of focus was a lot on archetypes or energy circuits right or I mean can you, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by by that like how that um like how that become how that is the bridge like mm -hmm. well this is uh, the archetypal language that carl jung has developed through his um uh, spending time and connecting with many different ancient cultures from around the world and then recognizing that uh, actually we are all still engaging in that language although mostly unconsciously and in each of our lives there is this uh, uh, heroic journey that is taking place we are going through the different rites of passage different uh, initiations into maturation and recognition of our role not only in society but in the universe mm. and so then um, in most of our lives today this is something that is unconscious and yet still happening in the indigenous societies dreams have a lot to do well really. dreams have a lot to do with it and more than that is the symbolic meaning of the dreams and then, of course, it relates to our everyday life and the symbolic meaning of our everyday life. And For the indigenous people, they saw that uh, actually this is something that uh, has to be uh, brought into an intentional way. Otherwise, when it happens in an unintentional way, it can be a lot more difficult and destructive. Right. So, for example... I'll just bring a little example. When I first came to Peru, in 2001, I came to Peru um, at first in August of 2001 from New York. And um, when I was in New York and I lived there for a few years beforehand, uh, people in New York are not, uh, were not necessarily known for their, uh, uh, how to say, uh, relational uh, skills. Human, <laughs> human relational skills or manners. <laughs> uh, maybe and um, and then I went to the Amazon and I partook in some of the Amazonian indigenous ceremonies that uh, were a rite of passage for me at that time and then uh, going through that rite of passage with other people in the ceremonies that were held in this more uh, nurturing intentional container uh, we all felt much more connected and open to each other and so then while I was in the Amazon and the 9-11 happened in new york and upon me coming back to new york and so after initially going i came back for a few months and then moved to the amazon for three years but when i came back to new york after my own rite of passage i actually witnessed the whole new york area went through their own rite of passage and because of that uh, powerful uh, experience then people started to actually be a lot more kinder and supportive and uh, open with each other. And so it was a rite of passage that took place, and yet it took place in a less intentional way. Mm. And because of that, it involved much more destruction and suffering. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's and, uh, taking place all the time, right? And everyone's journeys. Um, but you're saying when you put more inten intentionality to the way you live your life. I mean, I, that's kind of what, what I'm hearing is, you know, living life from kind of your purpose or, you know, figuring out more of drilling down what your values are, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so that's really what it's about, is the recognition of the values in each moment of one's life, mm. living one's life in a more intentional way, where every moment is an opportunity to open up, to recognize each other on a deeper level, to become uh, more patient, more generous, more vulnerable. And so this is something that we can learn a lot from these ancient traditions that have been cultivating examples of that. And so uh, this relates to the archetypal language, not just living one's life as if it's uh, just a random occurrence and then uh, not having any deeper meaning or purpose or intention. And of course, then uh, trying to avoid and hide in all kinds of uh, experiences and instant gratifications that don't have any lasting benefit. So then find, this kind of life. Do you find that a lot, of the, um, a good portion of the people that come down to do these retreats are, are in that particular place? You know, some of the new ones at least? I find myself to be in that place. Huh? Yeah, me too. You know, I and mean, <laughs> we, are, we are all byproducts of uh, the current society and uh, it is quite ingrained on on deeper levels of with some people it can be you know um, more uh, visible but uh, this is still something we are all interconnected with each other we are all tuned in and uh, definitely uh, it helps me to stay in uh, this uh, stream of the reminders that uh, these traditions provide on the level of being to keep returning to that and then seeing of course how easy the mind tends to wander off and then uh, recognizing uh, how we can all support each other in that way and yeah. how life does become much more meaningful how life becomes uh, much more um, I hear um, you. Healing. Huh? i can hear your boy in the background yeah 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 my kid is being put to sleep by his mother i yeah and so so there's the carl Jung archetypal you know transpersonal psychology component you know which is like you're saying is it, it's kind of something that's just happening all the time and it sounds like you kind of are maybe some of some people's maybe first exposure to that or kind of like teaching them how to you know find those values and and really uh, con being a con I, I like to think of it as like a contemplative kind of approach to life you know where you're always kind of asking questions and being curious and um, and then you know dr drilling down and finding what your values are so there's that component and then um, I'm still really curious about the like the how like relational leadership or uh, authentic relating circling um, I know you guys so I imagine you guys circle up after these you know um, ceremonies and stuff like that which because you guys do some plant medicine ceremonies ayahuasca san pedro stuff like that um and other th mm -hmm. uh, other types of ceremonies um which send you on like a journey i, I personally have never uh, uh been a part of an ayahuasca ceremony or san pedro um so i'm just imagining things um i can't speak from experience but I imagine because I have experimented with other psychedelics uh, and gone on journeys, um, oftentimes by myself and sometimes with other people. But I would imagine that maybe you circle up and share, each person would share their, what they experienced with each other. And that would be kind of a way that they would kind of integrate and, uh, you know, their journey, like um, by sharing it. And do you teach this type of like kind of authentic relating to, to do that, that, that part of it, or like how to, like, for instance, some of the, sure. I mentioned some of the, just a couple of the essences, like owning your own experience or assuming, you know, the highest intent and, and, and someone else mm -hmm. or uh, welcoming everything and assuming nothing or, um, you know, honoring yourself really first and foremost, just knowing when, when things aren't right for you or when you need to take care of your physical vehicle or, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. Community agreements is uh, Community. an essential part of uh, 
of our work. And then, of course, within the traditions that we work with, there is an integral approach. So the, the particular um, practices, the particular uh, uh, piece that uh, our institute brings into the ceremony work has to do with uh, the integration and uh, the um, greater cultural context. So beyond just the ceremonies is the recognition how everything is a part of this process, how the ceremonies, they are just a miniature version of life. Mm. And then uh, being able to relate to each other's experiences in the ceremonies in a non-dual way, something that uh, goes beyond just uh, uh, mystical and, uh, you know, uh, personified interpretation of it. So to be able to recognize this uh, universal language and how underneath all the different shapes and forms and images that people may be experiencing, there is this uh, essential journey towards openness. There, there is this willingness to face conflicts and uh, how our greater organism is communicating through each one of us essential messages that help to practice that embodied relatedness. With the community agreements in particular, there is um, uh, this approach that we take where the agreements themselves, they're really more than, uh, than just uh, different agreements. It's uh, one greater agreement. It's a certain frequency that we can cultivate and keep coming back to on deeper and deeper levels. So initially, it may just sound as words, where it's, uh, you know, uh, being engaged or uh, uh, honoring the true self or uh, no gossiping. Mm. And um, then gradually it starts to uh, be recognized on the level of being, on the level of a certain frequency that we can start to cultivate in our collective space together that becomes quite tangible. So then, of course, uh, that is uh, something that uh, uh, amplified, that is enhanced through all the other work that we do, whether it's breath work or whether it's uh, the integration circles or the ceremonies themselves. It all points to this essential way of uh, sharing presence with each other. Yeah, the word that again is coming up for me is, you know, authenticity, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, another, the one thing that popped up was, uh, you know, non-dual, you know, and you're mentioning in, in this day and age, a lot of people are going down to South America and, um, you know, going um, uh, on journeys and things like that. And is, I mean, what I get from your community, your institute, just the, back to the, this authenticity, you know, of um, it not being like you're saying, just uh, a mystical kind of state that just has a short health, uh, a short shelf life. And then when someone goes home, maybe they, um, you know, they're, they're okay for a few weeks and then it's kind of forgotten about. Um, you're, it sounds like you're really trying to create it an experience for your, um, you know, your visitors, um, your community um, that's lasting, that's, that, that really gets deep and in, deeply embedded through all these really thoughtful, authentic ways of uh, communicating and um, preserving this really, um, this ancient culture and then refining that into, you know, this bridge that, that uh, is, is individual, it sounds like, to each person. But, Mm -hmm. It's individual to each person in a way that each person recognizes uh, this uh, original unconditional state that we all know from the mother's womb. And then uh, seeing all the many different unique qualities and talents and abilities to share that state in our own particular circumstances. And otherwise, this is something that we start to be able to resonate with each other on and recognize that truth in each other because each one of us knows it deep within oneself. So we we got like a little, you know, um, just to kind of do a little chronology, you know, you, you, you this journey for you started with, with your own, sounds extremely challenging situation with a, 
it sounded like what you thought was going to be a terminal illness. And then that led to this inner work and spiritual pursuit and your own hero's journey down to South America. Um, coming back to the States um, around the time, you know, post 9-11 and seeing, you know, the contrast from when you left to coming back and that kind of archetypal role that 9-11 played. Um, and then going down and, and, and meeting your wife and her permaculture experience and creating this amazing community. Where, where do you see things going? Like from here, um, what, mm -hmm. what, what's next on, on your list of goals? Well, this is uh, what our conversation has been leading into, um, where through this individual transformation, through this uh, recognition that actually we are all related, that there is this interconnectedness that uh, is existing and everyone is actually doing their part, whether they know it or not. And then starting to have more and more inspiration and willingness to do one's part more consciously. So, it's so this is uh, finding how that, the Paititi Institute. Finding that. What is that? Yeah, you know. I didn't hear the last part. Finding that heart of hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. And so then, of course, you, you know, working through this uh, individual um, conditioning, and then uh, at a certain point recognizing uh, that this individual conditioning is uh, actually a portal to the shared heart when faced and engaged with. And then from that point on, actually starting to be in service to that shared heart and seeing how the only way to resolve uh, this uh, collective uh, um, affliction is uh, for each individual to do their part. I, and um, the way you put that, like every um, every person's mm. challenge is is a uh, would you say a portal or a gateway to the to that the heart of hearts. It's like that's mm -hmm. that's what teaches us empathy, and that's what made, like in my experience, at least, you know, my challenge is has is, is been the greatest teacher of, of of empathy and acceptance and curiosity. You know, just realizing you know, the potential of what other people might have, you know, be going through. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if someone wanted, you know, to, to, um, to come down for a retreat or possibly, um, you know, do a work study or do the, uh, like a permaculture certification or even contact mm -hmm. you for potentially, um, um, I got someone messaging me. Um, sorry what would you how what would be the next step that you would recommend you know for those things uh, obviously you have your website you have tons of um i've been watching all the the uh testimonials all the youtubes which are just beautiful mm -hmm. uh tons of them on there and everyone's just really special um so i, I would recommend people checking that out i i personally love just hearing other people's stories and you know their personal take on on Petiti. Um, but yeah, what would you recommend, um, like if someone's considering doing something like this? Well, we have uh, many different uh, initiatives and uh, programs listed on our site at uh, the paititi-institute.org. And um, otherwise, uh, yeah, people can find some relevance in uh, our talk here and some of the other talks that we have available, the articles that we have on the site. And um, that's a good place to start with. Okay. And is it is it okay to talk about, I know we, we, met, we talked about some content you've been developing. Is that, is that something you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. Sure. We are continuously developing content and finding well, ways to share. On um, content maybe to like... share what we find so inspiring and motivating with the world and so um, one of the programs that we've been developing is the uh, home study course mm, okay. and uh, and so this course encompasses a lot of this cultural context because again 
in in my experience living with the indigenous traditions and working with these lineages um, it's not just uh, this uh, occasional um, experience or a ceremony um, but there is this greater cultural context and then uh, to be able to relate to it, to, to recognize and learn about this language of nature, the language of the organism, the language that is coming through each moment of our lives, that is coming through not only our dreams, but it's coming through every breath that we take. And so to actually learn this language and see how the indigenous people have been working with this language, it's not a conceptual language. It's not a language of words it's a, a language of being it's a, a language of metaphors of symbols of associations of uh, rites of passage and so to actually engage and recognize it then allows people to really cultivate that in every moment of their lives and it's not just a philosophical thing it's very practical and very tangible and something that can be embraced in each moment beyond the conceptual process beyond the thoughts on the level of being recognition that all of those um, sensations emotions feelings um, existential states they are present with each one of us in this very moment and we can relate to them through the different symbols in our lives through the different situations through the different people and relationships that we are having but essentially, this is something that is embodied. It's this uh, vulnerability, how you relate to it, this authentic embodiment. Mm. And uh, sometimes we refer to it as this uh, bravery of vulnerability, being brave enough to be vulnerable. Yeah, and for me, I know what, what really um, what comes up for me when I think of that is safety, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and when I read, when I, you know, when I just spend time with you more than anything, that's this feeling of peace and safety I get. And then just all the care and effort you put into creating Petiti, um, it feels like to me a really safe place to come and be vulnerable and explore the edges of, of, of that vulnerability. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then developing this content, um, the online content or, um, what did you call it again? Um, like, um, the home study course. Study. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It's embodied through nature home study course. Yeah. A human an embodiment, you know, again, that's, um, a big part of, you know, what I'm really passionate about and, um, really focusing on with this film is you know communities cultures practices that really invite that kind of um fearlessness of heart you know and vulnerability um and not only welcome someone as they are but encourage them to even go deeper and and uh and bring more of what's true for them forward you know and support them in that and welcome in that even if maybe it's you know not their you know, their thing, but always still committed to the relationship, you know, the focus always being on elevating the relationship versus, you know, controlling someone or what have you, or getting, you know, being right or wrong or getting what we want. But um, mm -hmm. um, so what I was gonna say is that creating that is, it seems like your last of the five kind of, and I didn't get to these, or actually, I did read through all of them. But that last one, understanding consciousness and engaging in cognitive evolution. And that's another really, you know, thing I'm focusing on with the documentary is, you know, um, you know, it seems like you're, that's, you're taking that as your big value is taking this ancient wisdom and putting it again, like building this bridge, which in modern times, you know, is this work study or, or home study courses, things like that, to where people that maybe don't have the, 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 uh, availability, even, you know, even it could be a health, um, situation or something like that, where they just can't really get, make the trip down there, but they could still benefit from 
this ancient wisdom and 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 uh, guidance from 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 your community, um, even at a distance, which I think is is really special and really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what I uh, really see that is needed in the world today is um, just uh, many different ways to relate to each other and to find that connection and uh, then seeing how everything can become a tool for that relatedness. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, the relatedness itself is uh, just uh, this uh, certain approach, this uh, cultivation of a certain attitude, like you shared earlier, it's not about the uh, different experiences that we have. You know, I may have a very enlightening experience one moment, and then I may have, uh, you know, a very difficult experience in another. And so then, uh, rather than identifying with the experience as cultivating a certain attitude, a certain disposition mm. to engage each experience in this uh, uh, open-hearted way. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, seeing how in that way we can all uplift each other, how we can all heal through each other. So each individual that uh, is healed in my own presence in my own life then allows me to experience a deeper healing myself. Amen to that, brother. <laughs> I think that's maybe a good spot to end on right there. Yeah. Um, you know, helping my brother, my sister heal, you know, creating that opening for them to feel, to, to feel safe, to, to, to be vulnerable. Um, you know, creates a healing in myself. And I mean, that's really the essence of uh, me to, to and, and, and that part of, of this practice. Looks like I lost Roman. Where did he go? Um, yeah. So I guess we're going to close things up there. Um, oh, Roman wants to be, there we go. Add <laughs> you there roman oh adding adding i swear this is like star trek <laughs> for a moment it's like i'm beaming you up scotty you know like you lost you uh -huh. for a minute it yeah. happened last time too the mm -hmm. yeah this has been lovely i mean i honestly i could just keep talking for hours um but I know you're a very busy man and got lots of things going on. Beautiful baby there to take, take care of. So um, we can do this again sometime. And um, thanks for sharing your beautiful community and, and your beautiful uh, family with us and everything you've done. So just really appreciate your time and all your wisdom and your passion. So, yeah. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate your dedication and, your wisdom as well. This is what I was sharing right before we got disconnected. <laughs> is uh, this uh, uh, recognition of the highest potential in everyone. And uh, then that allows us all to continue working with that. Yes. Amen. <laughs> all right. Well, mm -hmm. you have a beautiful evening and we will see you uh, next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And we'll continue. And it's been uh, okay. Take care, Brian. Post your in the comments if you have any questions for me or Roman. Um, and yeah, just let us know that you're out there, even if you uh, aren't watching this live and you see it later. Um, if you if anything comes up from you watching this um, and you have questions for Roman, um, it's the best best way to do it. So um, you have direct access to him. So all right, have a good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good night. Oh, continue without guests. Oh, how's it going, everybody? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye now. Thanks for tuning in. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, still working out all the kinks with all this stuff, um, but it's pretty amazing to be able to drop in with somebody in Peru, uh, somebody like Roman. Um, just uh, really loving um, talking to 
to different people and just getting different perspectives. And uh, again, my number one uh, intention with all of this is just, uh, you know, exploring my curiosity and um, figuring out ways that maybe we can uh, do things better, refine some of these practices, um, share them with each other and share them with the world. So uh, thank you again and have a wonderful evening. Ciao.